welcome uh, this morning, afternoon, evening also, maybe wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the second event in security, privacy and innovation, reshaping law for the AI era. This symposium is co-sponsored by the Rice Center on Law and Security at NYU Law School, by the Burke and Klein Center at Harvard University, by Just Security and the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. The symposium is an effort to convene experts to examine how the legal frameworks that govern public and private action must adapt to the demands of AI. The first event in this symposium held last Friday examined AI enables surveillance and digital authoritarianism. Next Friday, we will explore patent eligibility reform as an imperative for national security and innovation. Today's event, uh, I am extremely happy that we will focus on, in, on constitutional values and the rule of law in the AI era, an extremely important and timely uh, discussion. How are AI-enabled technologies changing the threat landscape? What safeguards do we need to protect constitutional values? Where do we need Congress, the courts, and the executive branch to take action? Before we begin our session, uh, I would like to provide some information about the CLE credit. This event has been approved for one credit hour in the areas of professional practice category for New York State CLE credit. At a certain point in the program, roughly a bit after we've ended the discussion, we will pause to display and read aloud a CLE course code or probably several codes, I will see. And those seeking the, the, the CLE credit need to record this code and submit uh, to uh, an attorney affirm affirmation form. So uh, attendees have received a link normally to the attorney affirmation, affirmation form, sorry, I'm learning about a new process here, uh, in, <laughs> uh, in their reminder email for the event. And the form will also be sent after the event uh, has concluded. So uh, last remark on this, this event is appropriate for both newly admitted and experienced lawyers. So I will briefly share my name. I'm Julia Wono, an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And I'm today joined uh, for this discussion by uh, Glenn Gerstel, Gerstel, I am sorry, uh, a former NSA general counsel, senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you, Glenn, and, and welcome. And we're also joined by Aziz Hook, the Frank and Bernice J. Grinberg Professor of Law at University of Chicago Law School. Welcome, Aziz. And we are also joined by Rihanna Pfefferkorn, uh, a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Welcome, Rihanna, and uh, welcome, everyone, once again. So without Further ado, I suggest that we transition directly to our subject. So um, I would suggest that we take a bit of hate first and we will ask for the help of Glenn here uh, to please help us situate what we're talking about when we're questioning this compatibility of US constitutional values and rule of law with AI. So my question to you, Glenn, what role does AI currently play in national security? And are there any constitutional rights, ethical challenges that are raised uh, in this context by AI? Julie, thanks. Uh, and thanks to my other uh, distinguished panelists and also to uh, the two universities and Just Security and as well as the National Commission for sponsoring this uh, very important symposium, which as you said, Julie, is the second in a series. This one's about, as you said, constitution and the rule of law. And perhaps in no sector other than national security are those issues so directly and importantly implicated. Uh, to me, as someone who was a technology lawyer and someone who spent several years most recently in our intelligence community, if I had to sum up uh, the relevance of or, the, or the, the significance of artificial intelligence in just say three words in the national security sector, it would be critical, pervasive and problematic. I say critical because in many parts of the private sector, one could argue that the adoption of artificial intelligence is useful or even optional to improve efficiency, to stay commercially competitive, uh, even be socially desirable, such as using AI in 
medical applications or to help understand and mitigate climate change. But in national security, we really need to use artificial intelligence in order to address threats posed by new technologies, posed by adversaries' use of, of artificial intelligence. Um, Ever-changing geopolitical circumstances and the competition for emerging technology means that we, the United States, have to keep our capabilities at the cutting edge to face our, our adversaries. Um, the cost of mistakes in this area, um, either by not, fail, by not failing to, by failing to embrace the technology fully or by misusing it in a way inconsistent with our standards and values, um, all could endanger our national well-being and our, and our security. Um, so our national security agencies have, have really have no choice but to embrace the use of artificial intelligence, which is why I say it's critical. I said pervasive for, for two reasons. Um, first, there are changes to the definitive definition of national security that are underway that we all see. It used to be that national security meant worrying about maybe the rise of communism, the Cold War, where, where nuclear weapons were around the planet, and then after 9-11, focusing on counterterrorism. But now, in the aftermath of this most recent pandemic and su global supply chain disruptions and, and climate change, um, we're seeing all sorts of uh, requirements for national security to have a broader aperture. It, uh, national security now touches on every aspect of our, of our well-being due to, due to technology, um, whether it's a biological uh, aspect or environmental or all aspects of our digital lives. And the significance of that is that most of that information that relates to that broader aperture of, of national security is in open source information. It's not classified information. It's not digging into Russia's secret networks. So that leads to the second reason for that, for it being uh, pervasive, which is that with the digital age, and we all know this obviously, um, comes that much more data to process. The sheer volumes of open source data, uh, which are going to be needed for this wider definition of national security, um, are far broader than any analyst that even the biggest security uh, supply or spy agency could analyze. We need to use artificial intelligence to make sense of it, to analyze it. Um, Data collection methods are also going to be needed to, up, to be upgraded to, to deal with this. Um, and it's going to be um, uh, require really unprecedented levels of cooperation between the national security sector and the private sector. Um, and this kind of collaboration, what the intelligence community needs to do itself, raises all sorts of important ethical questions as to how to collect and process all this vast amount of data, which is why I say it's problematic. It's imperative to use it quickly, comprehensively and efficiently, artificial intelligence, precisely at a time when the tool is evolving in unforeseen ways and having, having applications that we haven't yet forecast. And yet, at the same time, we don't really know what we want in privacy. I'm sure the other panelists will co be commenting more on that. But we have both what we want to do, as well as the limits we might impose on, on how we do it, in very uncertain territory. Uh, we're trying to measure both parts and we don't really have a good yardstick for either. We're using a spandex tape measure if you want. So putting this criticality, pervasiveness and problematic nature all together uh, means that we have a lot to discuss. And with that, I'll turn it back over to, to the panelists to, to pick up on some of those threads. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn, for you know giving us this uh, extremely important big picture. I've taken a few notes, as you've you've seen. Probably, uh, we've talked about competition and the need to stay on top, and the, yeah, the need to collaborate also with private companies, and specifically around the issue of data collection. And I would like to, um, you know, go to Rihanna. We we briefly touched upon with Glenn the issue of privacy. So, can you tell us a bit more? about, of course, the, the implications for Fourth Amendment, but also for others, including in criminal prosecutions when it comes to the use of, uh, of AI. Yeah, sure. Um, good morning. Thanks for, thanks for having me here. Um, I think we're going to probably end up talking a lot today about the Fourth Amendment ramifications of AI-based tools um, and algorithmic uses of AI in uh, criminal investigations. Um, one clear uh, court area of concern that courts seem to be thinking about 
with regard to these kinds of tools is whether uh, AI can give rise to probable cause for the issuance of a warrant at the investigatory phase. And then given that uh, we don't necessarily always understand how a tool was designed, how an algorithm works, what the inputs were, uh, how good the data was, what the parameters are that are set within it, that then after you move past the investigatory phase and into the prosecution phase can give rise to concerns under the Fifth and Sixth Amendment due to uh, the possibility for uh, a tool to encode and, and reproduce uh, biases that uh, evince unlawful discrimination that raises equal protection concerns. And then also for uh, defendants to have the right to a fair trial and the confrontation of the evidence against them and witnesses against them uh, to the extent that AI is not the sort of evidence we're used to in terms of being explainable. Um, that also raises uh, uh, some concerns there, and it can even raise uh, Eighth Amendment concerns to the degree that uh, excessive bail, excessive fines and punishment uh, could potentially be recommended uh, by a faulty uh, algorithm out of proportion to what is actually appropriate to a particular case. And so I think we're gonna talk a lot today about the critical role of, of judges having to, uh, and, and defense counsel as well, having to stand up and more critically examine how these work in order to avoid infringing upon uh, criminal defendants' uh, constitutional rights. No, oh, it's uh, it's extremely uh, extremely important, and thank you so much for reminding us uh, that you know this, these are well, they're court proceedings that are also affected by the use of AI. We've heard certainly in the public public sphere, public discussions, some examples, some quite chilling examples, and I would like to uh, follow up on the, on that subject with uh, Aziz. Once again, welcome. Uh, since we are we we're talking about court proceedings, how do constitutional ideas of um, equal protection and due process actually translate or probably fail to translate when one, one moves from human to AI dominated modes of decision making? Well, thank you so much, Julian. Thank you for your terrific uh, framing and moderation of this debate. And thanks to all of the institutions who have put together this important panel. I'm, I'm really appreciative of being folded in. Um, what Julie's asked me about is the way that two values that in the US constitutional context are uh, embedded in the text of the 14th Amendment, uh, equal protection and due process, uh, apply uh, uh, to say, uh, criminal justice and the national security issues that Glenn has described, and whether the introduction of AI tools rather than human judgment changes the way that we should think about equal protection and due process. And I'll, I'll focus on uh, equal protection. To start off with, it's important to say that these are both equal protection and due process issues are rife across the domain of criminal justice, where race is obviously uh, an important issue, uh, and national security, where questions about ethnicity, questions about uh, the basis for targeting, either by domestic uh, security forces, uh, police or FBI, who uh, conduct counterterrorism investigations domestically, uh, but also internationally with respect to detentions uh, that are still going on at Guantanamo, um, equal protection and due process concerns uh, are often uh, uh, raised or available, um, even if uh, the, under current uh, US law, uh, litigants or claimants may not have a procedural vehicle to press their equal protection or due process rights. And that's something that I think we're gonna come back to later in uh, the discussion. So how do these how do these rights translate over into uh, an era where uh, at the tip of the sphere, uh, it's a machine making a judgment using some ML uh, technology or tool or process uh, rather than a human being. Consider the, uh, our legal regime for equal protection. Under present equal protection doctrine, there's, there's really two rules that coexist. Uh, first, it's, it's not permitted for government to act on the basis of racial intent. Uh, and second, and separately, uh, it's not permitted for government to act on the basis of a racial classification. That's the issue in uh, cases concerning affirmative action, like the Harvard case that's before the Supreme Court. 
uh, at the moment. Notice that uh, the concerns that are often raised about AI tools, particularly in the criminal justice context, which Rihanna mentioned, um, are concerns about race, but they're not concerned about concerns about either intent or concerns about classification. For example, many of the concerns that have been pressed against predictive tools in the bail context concern the disproportionately high number of false positives that have been observed within African-American black populations in comparison to white populations. Under current um, equal protection doctrine, that kind of disproportionality is not a concern. So how do the ideas that, that are available under equality law applicable to the machine learning context? I think the answer to that is simply not very well. So take first the question of intent. It is rarely the case in the context of the design and implementation of machine learning tools that there is a particular individual who acts with a quintessential invidious intent. Rather, historical experience seems to suggest that the designers of uh, artificial intelligence tools will often uh, neglect or simply be ignorant of the different experience of the minority group or of women, right? Both groups that are not well represented among programmers. And as a consequence of that negligence or inattention, right? The failure to think hard about the kind of historical data that's being used to train a, uh, an ML tool, uh, you have negative, serious negative consequences emerging, right? The concept of, in, of impermissible intent and in constitutional law does not give us any traction with respect to that issue. Now think about the issue of classification. The Supreme Court in the last decade has become increasingly skeptical of the use of race classifications across a wide range of areas, including the criminal law domain. But why or when should we care about race classifiers uh, when they're used by machine learning tools? Does the fact that a classifier use race as a feature of the training data, make it uh, impermissible under the Equal Protection Clause? It's hard to see why that should be the case. We know already that the failure to include a trait like race or gender can lead to serious and large uh, error rates that affect the uh, marginalized or subordinated group, right? If race turns out to track something that in fact is real in the world, and that if you don't account for, you get more false positives or false negatives as the case may be. We also know that um, a rule that bars a machine learning designer from using race as a feature may well have very little effect because there are so many things in the world that are correlated to race, uh, the same is true for gender. Uh, the famous example of, of this is the Amazon uh, hiring algorithm that singled, or that, that was that aimed to hire engineers and that singled out uh, resumes with the names of women's colleges on them and threw those out. Women's colleges were highly correlated with women's names. Women were rare among the historical pool of uh, engineers being hired. Therefore, uh, the machine threw out uh, uh, CVs with the names of women's colleges. So our equal protection doctrine is woefully under-equipped to deal with a world in which machines using ML or AI technology are ranking and classifying individuals. And we need to really start thinking hard about another model of equality that focuses upon the problem of how our governmental decision-making processes carry forward and entrench patterns of historical disadvantage. I think that's a good place for me to stop, but I'm happy to come back in questions to the due process uh, question. No, it's absolutely fascinating as is. And we see here kind of, um, you know, on the one hand, Glenn reminded us, you know, the world in which we're living in which there is a fierce competition for adoption of, you know, AI to respond to new threat models. And on the other hand, we'll also have, well, systemic uh, difficulties and frameworks that are probably not adapted. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to that, uh, Aziz, because 
next question I have is what to do then, but we'll get back to that very soon. Uh, Glenn, I would like to, um, you know, get back on some of the initial remarks that you, you, you've you made uh, and including, you know, the, 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 the challenges raised for the Fourth Amendment when we decide to rely on AI increasingly in our societies. So um, we've relied a lot, a lot on it, on the Fourth Amendment to address concerns of civil rights and privacy uh, this far uh, in, the, in the digital revolution. So why can't we continue to do so with AI or can we, I don't know, I wanted to ask you. Okay, thanks, Julie. Uh, and that follows very na naturally from Aziz's comment about the, as he says, the inadequacy of the equal protection uh, uh, format or framework, I should say, to, uh, to, to help us navigate in the area of the proper use of AI. And I think we're going, we see the same thing as I'll comment on in a minute or two about the Fourth Amendment, which after all is the fundamental, the most fundamental element of our constitution that relates to privacy. That, that's the source uh, from a constitutional law point of view of our, of our notions of privacy, even though, as we all know, in the 54 words of the Fourth Amendment, there is no mention of privacy. So the amendment uh, does, however, uh, in provide important uh, guidelines and rules and boundaries for, for the government in, this, in, in its uh, uh, both undertaking surveillance, searching for information, uh, as well as querying the information and analyzing that. Uh, all of that is implicated by the Fourth Amendment. But the amendment was adopted as, of course, in 1792, before the digital age. And it's an inadequate compass to guide our society in, uh, in the consequences of, of technology. And in particular, um, doesn't really give us uh, a guideline for, for the notions of privacy as we need it today. And of course, the amendment also applies only to the government not to the private sector. I'm not advocating that it applies to the private sector. I'm simply observing that uh, the vast amount of data about our uh, personal and commercial lives these days is in the hands of the private sector, uh, not the government. And yet there's no comparable limit uh, on, um, on the private sector. We don't even have privacy legislation uh, in the United States in a, in, a, in a full way that would address this. So as we continue to forge ahead in the adoption of new technologies, I, I think we really haven't confronted as a US society uh, what it means to have privacy in the digital age. Now, if you look at other technologies, whether it was railroads, telephones, electricity, whatever, um, as the technologies developed, and they took a few decades to really become impactful, uh, regulations lagged, but we ultimately figured out how we wanted to regulate it, what the societal norms were, and, and we were able to reach uh, for what for our society is an, is an appropriate balance between regulation, between public and private, and just how we want the technology to, to behave in our hands. Um, we, haven't, we haven't done that in the, in the case of the digital age because it's basically, basically about uh, two decades old, take your pick, we could argue the exact start of it, but uh, it's quite recent. The principal case dealing with the Fourth Amendment in this context, of course, the most recent one, is United States versus Carpenter decided just a few years ago. Um, uh, while it does provide guidance in this area, I, I think it actually shows how little guidance the, Constitu the Todd Constitution through the Fourth Amendment is able, is able to provide in this area. After all, uh, there were nine justices who came up with five separate opinions in that case, some of those opinions had very, very different conceptual ideas on why the case should be decided one way or another. Um, and by the very nature of our judicial system, which doesn't allow for advisory opinions, judges are forced to deal with the particular set of facts before them, a particular technology. The cases in the Fourth Amendment area, because the technology is evolving so rapidly, are often expressly rooted and based upon the particular technology before the court. The judges say so themselves. Indeed, chief, the Chief Justice in the Carpenter opinion expressly said, this is a narrow decision. This is a narrow opinion. It applies to this particular case of tracking cell, cell, cell phone uh, geolocation data for more than seven days. It doesn't say anything about any, it doesn't necessarily say anything directly about anything else. We can read into it all sorts of things, but that's just individual speculation. So this, the problem of dealing with case or controversy schemes in a situation where the decision itself, the judicial decision is based and, and the rationale is based on the particular facts before the court 
is problematic in an area where technology is rapidly developing. It's not a problem in the area of, say, contract law or tort law, where the principles enunciated in the particular case aren't limited to just that case. No one says that a contract ratification case has principles that are only limited to contracts printed on blue paper written on Thursday, which was the subject of that particular case. They're generally applicable. Same with tort law. We can apply negligence concepts in one particular fact pattern across an entire range of fact pattern, and it feels right. It feels intuitively correct. It feels internally and intellectually consistent. That's not true when the technology keeps changing. These decisions are inherently backward looking or retroactive, which feels like the wrong approach when addressing new technology. Um, I, uh, I teach, a, I have a guest lecture, uh, Aziz, at, uh, once, uh, once a year at, at the Harris School at the University of Chicago. And at the beginning of it, I ask the students who are all really sharp from every side of the political spectrum, I give them the several of the Supreme Court cases in the Fourth Amendment area. I give them the fact patterns without the case and ask them to rule on it one way or the other. About half the students come out the way the particular case did. Another half, equally bright, come out the other way, proving that in this particular area, the Fourth Amendment doesn't really give us the guidance that it needs to in the digital age. I'm not suggesting we abandon it. I'm not suggesting we weaken its implications at all. I'm simply pointing out its inadequacies and our need to address artificial intelligence, rulemaking and norm making in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. Rihanna, I'd like to get to you on, on two uh, aspects. So the first one is related to what Glenn was just saying. Do you think, yes, that the privacy framework is not adapted or it's the Fourth Amendment? the reasonable expectation of privacy, as you, you know, rightly put it when we prepared the session, do you think we, we have to give up on that, basically? And the second one, uh, still related to something Glenn mentioned um, about, you know, contract, well, just wanted to know, are there other bodies of law that come into tension with the, you know, constitutional issues raised by AI? I thought you might want to bring up something on that. Thank you. Sure, yeah, I mean, so to pick up on, on what Glenn was talking about. Um, we have often found that the Fourth Amendment uh, framework that we have become accustomed to doesn't necessarily keep up neatly with technological advances. And it's been a central preoccupation of, of the courts to ensure that uh, technological advances do not shrink the uh, amount of privacy that we are traditionally uh, entitled to expect going back to the times of the founders when you know obviously uh, the world looked quite a lot different than it does now. Um, and you know when when we had the formulation of the reasonable expectation of privacy test, this was in the late 1960s and within you know 10 or 12 years we were already starting to see how that might not necessarily fit uh, a modern world where um, we started seeing the development of third party doctrine cases uh, regarding bank records regarding uh, phone metadata, uh, in the 1970s, um, where uh, even though we were talking about a dawning realization that uh, we have a digital age, where we have the use of computers, where people often uh, have not that much uh, occasion to decide to decline to participate in a thoroughly mediated world, uh, that nevertheless, the Supreme Court had limited the applicability of the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement in situations where uh, people were handing over information to a third party in order to get the business of daily living done, basically. And the response that we saw from Congress to uh, those cases in the 1970s, following up on what seemed like a greater trend towards privacy protective uh, cases in the 1960s, was instead to pass a comprehensive uh, framework for the protection of our electronic communications in the digital age. Um, that you know, collection of statutes is now itself uh, sort of showing its age and, and fraying around the edges because technology has advanced yet again in the 30 odd years since the Electronic Communications Privacy Act uh, was reorganized and, uh, and, and extended uh, under President Reagan. So I would tend to agree that if we want to see the level of privacy protection that as a society, we can come to some agreement hopefully on, uh, on having uh, to the degree that it may not be the case that courts would consistently hold that there uh, is a warrant requirement in or that uh, particular other constitutional uh, concerns can adequately be uh, covering uh, the different 
context in which we see AI tools arise, then it may be necessary to try and get out ahead of those issues, which may already be galloping out ahead of us, and uh, pass some sort of laws uh, to codify and clarify uh, what people's rights and expectations should be in these settings. Um, and you know, I, I think that we have seen in time and again that uh, you know Congress has to step in at some point or that other legislative bodies have to step in at some point, because otherwise it is entirely possible under the reasonable expectation of privacy framework that we'll gradually see a diminution of privacy. I know we've seen plenty of uh, uh, scholarship from uh, scholars such as Ori Kerr talking about this sort of equilibrium adjustment theory that as technology advances and society changes, that the Fourth Amendment is equipped enough to, to keep up. But nevertheless, I think we've seen a line of cases involving the usage of technologies, uh, such as the Kylo case um, coming up on 20 years ago now, um, that demonstrate how as a technology becomes uh, commonplace, which once was highly sophisticated and expensive and rare to use, uh, that can affect how people can subjectively and objectively uh, experience and expect privacy as uh, the you know, technological environment in which we live changes. And so to the extent that uh, Katz and Kylo and their progeny leave room for the diminution of privacy, uh, for example, in public, where I think we really are confronting a need to totally reinvent the doctrine of how much privacy we can expect in public places, given the advent of AI tools that can collect a large amount of information about us and synthesize it together, then it does seem like it is now uh, incumbent upon uh, legislators to try and, and find some ways to act. I think we can talk about the difficulties of what that action should look like, uh, but I do at least want to note that in some jurisdictions we have seen, um, if not at the congressional level in, at, in DC, uh, some efforts to try and set forth what those privacy protections and other protections ought to look like uh, at the state level. So for example, in California, uh, where I am, uh, we have uh, Cal ECPA, which was passed a few years ago, which regulates uh, state uh, lawmakers, or excuse me, uh, law enforcement, uh, with regard to things like saying you have to get a warrant if you want to get location data. Instead of having to run every single case up the flagpole, as Carpenter has caused us to do, to say, okay, well, that, what about six days of historical cell site location data? What about real-time cell site location data prospectively? Uh, the California uh, legislature said we're just going to pass one, you know, one ring to, to rule them all, basically. And similarly, we've seen some uh, efforts in some municipalities and one or two states uh, to regulate the usage of AI tools uh, in contexts that impact people's livelihoods and their rights and their lives. Uh, but it's questionable whether um, we will see a, a similar move at the federal level, I think, or even whether those uh, local and, and state laws are going to do uh, what they set out to intend to do in order to provide better outcomes by helping uh, human decision makers uh, incorporate these new tools into their, into their workflows. But I think we will be able to talk about that more going forward. To quickly address your, your other question, you know, I, we've also seen, especially in the court context, in the criminal prosecution context, how the use of non-disclosure agreements and contractual rights like those that Glenn was talking about can impede uh, the exercise of, uh, of somebody's uh, Sixth Amendment rights to a fair trial to the degree that um, even courts and uh, uh, police agencies themselves may be prohibited by the contract that they have with the vendor from whom they buy these tools, from disclosing how they work, from explaining how they work, that gets in the way of criminal defendants who might seek to challenge the accuracy, the reliability, or as Aziz was saying, to look for evidence of, of discriminatory intent in their design uh, from being able to uh, test those out in court. We've seen some uh, decisions, luckily, that have said, no, you can't use trade secrets laws or uh, contract theories uh, to trump some of these constitutional rights. But I think we'll only continue to see that issue, uh, these, these, these issues come up again and again. Thank you so much, Rihanna. So at this stage of the conversation, we, we kind of grasp how probably inadapted the current frameworks of many of them are. You've mentioned uh, some existing procedures, including warrants that could alleviate this kind of inadaptability. But I wanted to, to, to ask to Aziz, who uh, touched on you know, due process earlier in this conversation. And I wanted to ask you, Aziz, do the existing procedural mechanisms, including uh, Title III warrants, the FISA framework, especially well, national security issue matters. Uh, do these provide actually useful frameworks for enforcing constitutional norms when it comes to AI tools uh, for inference and predictions? And 
what sorts of constraints should then be applied if these are not working? So we, thank you, Julie. We, we've been talking uh, until now, and, and Glenn and Rihanna have elaborated uh, carefully about rights. But rights are claims against the government that ordinarily the government does not wish to cede. And rights, therefore, are inefficacious without remedies, without some mechanism to enforce them. And Julie's question tees up, I think, two different points about remedies. The first is that the current system of remedies that we have largely fails to protect individuals against the government with respect to privacy, discrimination, uh, and other uh, serious human or constitutional rights violations. Uh, and that second, um, even if it were to work better, it would be uh, conceptually ill-suited to the AI world. So let me elaborate both of those two points. Um, in the ordinary context of government acting coercively against individuals, there are large swathes of governmental activity uh, where it is infeasible to obtain a remedy of any sort against the government. For example, um, the Supreme Court over the last two decades has uh, dramatically narrowed the availability of after the fact tort suits called Bivens suits against the government, uh, the, against the federal government, excuse me. Uh, the result of that is it's extremely hard to bring, uh, to challenge the government's action um, uh, on the ground that it was unconstitutional if you're seeking damages. At the same time, the court has made available the remedy of exclusion of evidence that was obtained illegally pursuant to the Fourth Amendment in a narrowing gyre of cases. The court has uh, created, for example, an exception for instances in which the government acts in good faith. Uh, the government acts in good faith if there's no prior opinion uh, stating that what the government is doing is unlawful under the Fourth Amendment. The problem with the good faith standard is that litigants know they won't win anything uh, if they bring an exclusionary motion because of the good faith doctrine. This saps the incentives of uh, litigants who are at the cutting edge of the law to challenge Fourth Amendment violations. The absence of challenges of Fourth Amendment violations leads to uh, greater uncertainty in the law, and greater uncertainty in the law means that the good faith standard swallows uh, the, the rule when it comes to novel questions of Fourth Amendment law. And of course, technology is, is among the most, raises among the most important novel questions of Fourth Amendment law. Therefore, the Fourth Amendment is at the technological margin, sapped of ineffectiveness by the good faith doctrine. Or consider the civil remedy that's available under the FISA statute. Uh, that remedy is up before the Supreme Court in a case called Fazaga. Uh, the government's submissions in that case is that uh, 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 when a plaintiff invokes the civil remedy for unlawful surveillance under FISA, the government can assert the state secrets privilege and that that immediately results in a dismissal of the case. Accepting the government's uh, position, which the Roberts Court, it seems to me, likely to do, will in effect eliminate the possibility of civil remedies under FISA. So one should start by recognizing that the landscape of remedies for constitutional and human rights in the United States is exceedingly uh, uh, impoverished. So I, I, I should confess I have a book called The Collapse of Constitutional Rights on this point that's coming out later this year. The conceptual point is this. All of those remedies focus upon a one-to-one -one correspondence between the person who, against whom an intrusion is lodged in the first instance, and on the other hand, the, uh, the remedy or relief that is uh, available. So the person who is searched is the person who is able to seek a remedy. That one-to-one -one connection comes apart for reasons that we have already touched upon. Because inferences can be drawn from large pools of data that do not necessarily include your data, but which can be used to draw inferences on the, against you with respect to publicly available facts about you, the one-to-one -one correspondence between intrusion against person A 
and harm to person A breaks down. That means that the fundamental conceptual framework that underpins the warrant requirement, that underpins the exclusionary remedy, that underpins the constitutional do tort doctrine, Bivens, does not work in the AI context, and a new framework is needed. And, and maybe we'll talk about that, but um, I think that's a good place, provocative place to stop. No, it's uh, it's extremely uh, extremely interesting, and of course, I'm interested in Glenn's uh, thoughts on this, especially as a former NSA general counsel. Uh, I mean, uh, you're not speaking as such, but no, you know, right. your experience will ex help us understand better <laughs> your point on this. Yes, and uh, and before going to the NSA, um, uh, I I didn't have a full appreciation of of why in many cases it was important for the government to keep things secret, to keep them classified, whatever. And only when I was really inside in a classified environment, did I see the harm that resulted occasionally from leaks of classified information, et cetera. I, I'm not being a, a hawk on this point. I recognize there are competing arguments. Aziz made some very, very good points. I uh, uh, completely understand and appreciate his comments on the absence of remedies. This is a very tough problem. There are good arguments on both sides. That's why it continues to be an enduring problem. If it was easy, we would have solved it. Um, I might add to Aziz also, uh, when you're in excellent analysis, um, the issue of standing, which is very often there are plaintiffs who say, I've, I've, I think I might have been caught up in some surveillance or some kind of illegal activity. Uh, and the court says, well, in order, in order for you to have standing to sue, you have to prove that you were, you were in fact aggrieved, in fact injured. And the, and the plaintiff says, well, I, I don't have access to that information because it's secret. And so that's the end of the case. So obviously, again, you've, you've touched on that disease. Um, uh, I think the challenges in this area are, are very difficult. Uh, it sounds like we have a little bit of a consensus that between the limitations of the equal protection concept, the limitations of the Fourth Amendment, et cetera, um, the... There seems to be some sense that maybe the Constitution isn't providing us the full robust framework, intellectual framework that we need, and that um, legislation is needed, presumably federal. We certainly don't want a patchwork of 50 states uh, legislation in this area, along with industry self-regulation. I think that's where we're going to go. If we, Julie, more specifically to your question, if we look at um, the, the laws on the books right now that relate to, in the national security sector, that relate to surveillance and searches and um, it, it's pretty limited. There's a, there's a set of laws uh, about wiretapping and the circumstances under which the law enforcement agencies, principally FBI, can, can obtain uh, information about telephone calls, a little bit about internet, but not so much, um, and, uh, and other radio interceptions. Uh, the principal statute governing uh, the ability of the intelligence community to undertake um, uh, some kind of surveillance against United States citizens wherever they're located, because the Fourth Amendment applies to U.S. citizens whether they're abroad or on, or on domestic soil, is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is very mechanical, uh, rooted in the type of collection rather than what's happening, how it's being used. And I think we saw this issue, I'll just make a quick comment, we saw the fundamental issue of, of how the Fourth Amendment applies in this digital age context arise a couple of years ago when Congress adopted some, some restrictions on querying uh, the data, uh, uh, what it takes for a law enforcement or, or intelligence community analyst to go through data and look at it. Does the mere fact that a machine is sorting through data, looking for a name, a characteristic or something, and happens to come across, quote, your data in electronic form, does that mean you've been searched? Does that mean there's been some surveillance undertaken? This fundamental question of what it means to have a search in the digital age is absolutely critical to the issue of how we're going to apply artificial intelligence. And I can simply say that nothing in FISA or our current laws really addresses this issue. Uh, and that is, that is a major gap we're going to have to address. But first, as I go back, we're gonna to have to intellectually get agreement on what it means. What does it mean what is our sense of privacy? Are we really violated when a machine looks over a computer record? That's an issue. What is privacy? That is that exact. What do we mean when we say privacy? That's a, uh, you know, we would. I was talking about it with friends recently, and the expectations are indeed extremely uh, could be different from people, uh, from one citizen to another. 
and uh, not let alone from nations to another. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Glenn. Rihanna, do you, are you on the same line? The guardrails are not adapted. What should be done then? What's your take on that? Yeah, so I mean, the purposes for which information is collected and how it is used in the national security and uh, intelligence context can be very disparate from those in the criminal investigation and prosecution context. And we've seen um, how uh, the same uh, you know, secret sources and methods and techniques may potentially get used on either side of that line. And this is where we come back to those questions of uh, due process and, and fair trial and confrontation rights, uh, which is that if there is a particular tool that is in use um, on, on the national security and IC side of things, um, they will not want that to be disclosed uh, if it is being used also uh, in, to, to finger somebody in, in a criminal investigation. And so we have seen cases before, uh, not necessarily involving uh, AI, but <clears throat> in, in using you know, uh, novel technological techniques uh, to locate somebody who had uh, you know, hidden their true location. And when that um, tool, which relied on the uh, exploit of a flaw in the browser that the person was using, um, when the person who was then uh, being prosecuted for, for their criminal offenses, um, allegedly, uh, tried to challenge that in court, um, where this had tool had been used against uh, hundreds of people who were being uh, prosecuted uh, for visiting one particular uh, Tor hidden service, um, and their uh, true locations were, were revealed. Um, the exact workings of how uh, that tool worked for unveiling their true IP address, despite their usage of, of the Tor browser, uh, was deemed to be uh, kind of a, a problematic conflict in a lot of these cases between their rights to understand the tool that had been used against them and how the evidence against them uh, had been collected, whether it might be inaccurate um, or even have uh, opened up additional flaws or altered data that then uh, should not be admitted against them um, versus uh, the sensitivity of that tool or technique um, where eventually the government ended up classifying uh, the, the exploits so that they would not get disclosed, uh, leading to additional uh, discussion of whether it's adequate to have protective orders in place, whether somebody needs to get a clearance as, as is done under the, uh, under the SEPA law. And um, you know, just generally trying to figure out can the government go forward with these prosecutions if a government rule, or excuse me, if the, if the court rules uh, that it has to be disclosed? And we saw at least one case where after the court had ruled, yes, this is privileged uh, under the, the law enforcement privilege not to have to disclose their sources and their techniques, but it is also material to the defense to understand it. The government was put in uh, this quandary of having to eventually dismiss that case um, against somebody accused of a heinous crime because uh, they had deemed that it was better to drop this particular case uh, than to have be forced to uh, disclose uh, how this particular tool had worked. And so I think we will see that continue com to come up uh, in the usage of, of AI tools, where the ability to show your work essentially as investigators uh, and disclose that information uh, to the court and to the defendant pursuant to their constitutional rights and their rights under the criminal procedure rules uh, will continue to be in conflict where the same uh, sorts of tools and techniques may also be uh, useful on the national security and the intelligence side as well. Thank you very much, uh, Rihanna. Uh, we are right on time uh, to take a minute to uh, screen the code for the CLA, CLE credit. So uh, here it is. If participants can take, uh, we'll leave it for a minute before we move on to the next, um, to the next panel theme and discussion. So uh, let me let me read it for you to make it well help you security, privacy and innovation reshaping law for the AI era, virtual symposium fall 2021. And the course code will be RCLS9757. And I'm sure that was totally useless because everyone is taking a screenshot. So, <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to, <laughs> to read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was actually asked to read it. So it wasn't that useless. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Okay, um, we're slowly transitioning towards the Q&A, but before we do that, um, I did have some additional points that I was hoping we'd get time, a, a chance to discuss. So, Aziz, we've, you know, we've talked about the challenges um, and the inadequacy probably of the existing framework. So, and but also Glenn in, in the introductory remarks mentioned the relations, well, the necessary relationship between private companies, well, the government and private companies working together on, on well, trying to tackle some of these challenges. So I wanted to ask you, how does the introduction of AI change the balance of power between the state and large firms, but also between individuals? And how should we conceptualize the problem of power here in terms of right, in terms of principle and so on? Thanks, Julie. I think this is, um, and uh, it's, it's a nice place to maybe end our discussion because I think it raises, your question raises the possibility that in thinking about the way that AI is influencing the relationship between the state, uh, uh, powerful digital firms and individuals, we should not be analyzing the problem through the lens of rights, which are very much focused upon the relationship of government to isolated and discrete individuals. But we should think about the question of power. And we should think about the question of power in a more fluid and non-binary context in which there are multiple actors that can, uh, that can exercise power in ways that are sometimes complementary and in sometimes offsetting. So wh why do I say that? Because um, one of the principal effects socially and institutionally of uh, the development of, a, of the most recent um, spate of uh, machine learning tools, let's say starting from the work of Hinton uh, forward, is to dramatically raise the value of large pools of data. So the ability to acquire uh, large aggregates of data Right, so to, to, there's a scale uh, dimension there, and the ability uh, or the technical expertise to extract from that large pool of data uh, a prediction tool that can be applied out of sample suddenly becomes valuable in a way that was previously not the case. This technology comes upon the scene in a social context in which the principal holders of data to begin with are the government and a, a, a small set of private companies that are acting on the basis of their commercial incentives, perhaps not always with the interests of consumers or citizens uh, in mind. Um, and the, both the government and these uh, this small coterie of companies uh, benefits from benefit from economies of scale, economies of technical expertise, and a certain form of opacity with respect to the exercise of power that comes from the imbalance of knowledge between consumers and citizens on the one hand, and um, uh, the government and large firms on the other hand. So we we. We're living in a, in, a, in a different world than we were, uh, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago, in which there is a new form of power, and the power is not concentrated solely in the government. And the threats that are posed by that power are not concentrated solely in the government. They're dispersed. They're dispersed across large firms and uh, the government. Um, and, and I think that the core question for our age, uh, for this period, maybe not for our age, is how do we think about the plurality of ways that this new digital inferential power, how do, we, how do we think about the threats it poses to our core moral, legal, constitutional, and normative values? When those threats come from more than one place, when sometimes the way that government exercises digital power can piggyback on and, and uh, rebound exponentially because of its interactions with private entities, how sometimes private entities and the government can 
uh, offset and, and uh, match each other. We saw this with respect to, for example, searches of the Apple phone a few years ago. Um, and how we have developed two separate conversations. One conversation about what Shoshana Zuboff called surveillance capitalism, uh, and one conversation about what Bruce Schneier calls uh, the Goliath that is the state that has our data. And, and what we, I think, have failed to do as a, a community, and I maybe speak here of legal academics in particular, we have failed to think about how these dynamics of power interact overlay and either reinforce or uh, undermine each other. And I think that's a conversation that is well worth having. It's, uh, thank you so much Aziz. Uh, I feel like we're having this, when it comes to innovation and society these days where we do need to have this conversation but we fail to do so. And we are uh, afterwards in a situation in which, well, the harms are happening, the risks are there, and, and we don't know where to turn, basically. But thankfully, we have uh, platforms such as this one to moderate ourselves to look further into this, these issues. Um, before we uh, go to the Q&A, and I encourage you, please, in the audience, do not hesitate to ask uh, any questions that you, you, you may want to discuss with the panelists. I wanted us to look at the, well, what's coming next, right? Um, what what's what's the future going to look like in this uh, you know environment, uh, Glenn? My question is: so various countries have announced national plans for uh, adopting, but also dominating competition in AI. You've touched on it earlier today. What challenges does this represent for U.S. national security, not only on from a constitutional perspective, but the other ramifications? Thanks, Julie. Um, your question um, goes to a key point that that um, was uh, was very much part of Aziz's uh, comment earlier about the significant data that is going to be amassed not only by the government but by the private sector. Um, uh, and I just want to spend a second on that and then get more specific on your on your question. But um, with the advent of 5G, the Internet of Things, the increasing digitalization of our world, um, we can't imagine the amount of data that is going to be amassed in the hands of the private sector in the future. It will dwarf whatever any government is ever capable of. Uh, there are important questions that Aziz and the other panelists and you have, and Julie have raised about, uh, about how we need to manage this. And whether our laws are currently adequate sounds like we there's a bit of a consensus that our, our current framework is inadequate. Um, but these questions are going to be uh, thrown into high relief when we consider them in the context of national security um, for, for at least three reasons. Uh, first, um, on a very simplistic level, our intelligence community is now going to have far more targets, far more areas of interest that they need to keep track of for our national security, for our national well-being. We may now we now need to worry about everything from crop genetics around the world to climate change around the world to shipping logistics to the outbreak of of uh, global health concerns, etc. Um, so we now have many many more targets, uh, areas that we need to keep track of to, in order to understand better uh, for our national security. Uh, second. Uh, other countries um, are using technology, in particular uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in breathtaking and novel ways. We've certainly all read reports about how China uses artificial intelligence, including, including a facial recognition and facial characterization software to deal with uh, their, their Uyghur minority uh, in, the, uh, in the far west uh, provinces of, of China and how that raises uh, human rights concerns. Um, we are simply... Um, uh, not fully appreciating what it means for a country like China, which applies a whole of nation effort embracing their private sector, their state-owned enterprises, and the government itself towards one strategic goal, in this case, dominance for AI. They've said that. It's not a secret. They've made it clear, and it's stated in, their, in the CCP, Communist uh, Party of China's report, that they want China to be the dominant player in artificial intelligence in, in a matter of a couple of decades, as well as quantum computing and, and other related technologies. Uh, 
at a minimum, this poses competitive issues for us. And at a maximum, it may even pose existential and national security concerns for us. Um, and then finally, the, the third reason, in addition to the fact that our adversaries are galloping ahead, embracing a whole of society approach, is the fact that we've been talking about before that we, we need to be addressing these questions and implementing the use of artificial intelligence in a prudent, wise, sound way, precisely at a time when it's evolving very rapidly, innovating very rapidly. We don't have a yardstick to give us or, or guardrails to give us the, 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 the best and appropriate and most prudent ways of conforming its use to our, to our national uh, standards and values. Um, and, and this will require extensive coordination and collaboration with the private sector. Again, something that in the United States, we don't have a lot of experience. We have a very sharp dividing line between the private sector and the government. We do not look at all uh, in, our, in our legal system the way Europe and certainly uh, uh, countries like Russia and China do. This is going to raise some very profound questions. I'll just give you one tiny example of one and stop there. But uh, there has been some recent concern about whether the government, uh, through its spy agencies, can purchase data on the open market about the uh, pertaining to uh, to individuals' uh, locations, shopping habits, uh, whatever. Um, the information is gathered through open source information by public companies in in absolutely legal, legal circumstances. Is it okay for the government to just purchase that data and then run analysis, artificial intelligence analysis on it? Or does that implicate some privacy concerns because it's being done by the government, but not by the private sector? All important questions, no easy answers. Thank you so much, Glenn. Rihanna, briefly on that, on the future, and then we can um, answer some of the questions that have been asked. Thank you. Sure. So I think there are at least three different things that policymakers need to concern themselves with. Um, one picking up on where Glenn left off would be going back to my point earlier about uh, whether we need to rethink what sort of privacy protections people have in public, where traditionally there's been a very low level of privacy protection, but whereas uh, Aziz was uh, cogently explaining, the large volumes of data that can be gathered about us now may change the, the power balances um, and uh, call for a, a rethinking of that. Um, another is whether there should be some applications of AI that should simply be off limits whether to governments or in private application, there's been a lot of, of challenges to the use of facial recognition, for example, and saying, even if we put adequate guardrails or laws in place, that's not enough. There are going to be some domains where uh, this should just not be used at all. And if we agree that that is something where we should draw a bright line around what applications should, should that be. And then the third is that one uh, tension that the AI and ML community is trying to deal with is the tension between uh, explainability, interpretability of uh, an AI uh, model or algorithm and its accuracy, where something that is more accurate may be harder or even impossible uh, for the people, even the people who built it to explain. And so if the whole point of deploying AI technologies is that we expect them to be effective, which hopefully encodes an expectation of, of accuracy, um, how do we deal with these conflicting goals of wanting or needing to have uh, an explanation for how they work for due process concerns for probable cause analyses, uh, when it may be that those uh, very models that are more explainable may not work as well as intended. And so that's an area of uh, computer science that uh, is going to continue developing and uh, we'll hopefully see whether that is a tension that can be resolved. So those are the three that I would point to. Thank you so much, Rihanna. A lot of food for thought before we go. But if, before that, uh, we have uh, great questions here. So uh, Elena Quint, the president of the Cyber Law Society at Georgetown Law, is asking, um, can you discuss the possibility of using privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment to protect our an enumer enumerated constitutional rights challenges, challenged, sorry, by emerging technology? I'll ask through uh, two question and then um and then uh how scott davis is asking what about the penumbra of rights that led the court to find a right to privacy in roe versus wade shortly please because we still have two more questions thank you i i, I think i can try and answer very quickly um so um the i i, I 
the question, I, both questions are linked by the idea that maybe there are some rights that are not explicitly enumerated in the way that the Fourth Amendment is explicitly enumerated, but might nonetheless be protected. Often the right to abortion under Roe v. Wade is, is characterized in those terms. And recently there's been a debate about whether a, an element of the 14th Amendment uh, which talks about the privileges and immunities of citizens. And notice, by the way, that it's just citizens, right? So it's limited in, in, in ways that the Equal Protection Clause is not, uh, might have uh, traction, notwithstanding uh, decisions from the US Supreme Court in the 1880s that drain the Privileges and Immunities Clause off uh, meaning. Um, I, I wouldn't hold my breath with respect to these kinds of non-textual theories of entitlement that sound in the domain of digital or informational, uh, or I, I would add to that actually sexual privacy, because I think that's a, uh, an important domain um, that AI can intrude upon that we haven't uh, touched upon. Um, I, I think it's extremely unlikely that a court is go that, that the courts that we have, given their partisan comp composition, are going to uh, read this uh, ambiguous language in the 14th Amendment, are gonna take the concept of fundamental rights under the 14th Amendment that's at issue in Roe v. Wade and extend it in this direction. Um, I, I think that for um, Americans um, are, are fundamental, who are concerned about digital privacy, our fundamental uh, problem is that we, we don't have a federal forum, either in Congress or in the courts, that seems inclined in terms of political incentives and technically capable enough to, to really address those, these issues. And I, I think it's that gap in the, na in the national capacity that really has been driving uh, California's efforts, that's been driving attention in the US to what's happening in uh, the European Union through the GDPR, through the AI uh, uh, framework that was issued earlier this year, uh, there's just simply a sense that, that, that our own political institutions, you know, they're, they're not up to much and they're certainly not up to this. Thank you, Aziz. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read other questions that were asked in the, in the chat. So uh, one attendee would like to hear your perspective on potential of altering AI data in criminal investigations and giving an example of Recent allegations of gunshot detection vendor shot spotter who altered, which altered gun sh gunshot data at request of law enforcement. Then there's another great question. I'll let you choose. Uh, to at this point, what role in, can or should play regulatory agencies in protecting consumers? Alan Raoul, should FISA court appoint on an amicus to serve as technology to serve as technologist to help explain, assess algorithms and ML? And still from Alan. Superior Court in Wallen and versus Roe 77 rejected extending Roe versus way to information privacy. So that was just a remark. But yes, there are questions on role of regulatory agencies. Uh, what's the what's the your perspective on altering data in criminal investigations and FISA court uh, to appoint amicuses as technologists. And shortly. Possibly, <laughs> I mean, briefly. I'll I'll take the FISA one, but why doesn't Rihanna go ahead with the uh, the the criminal one? It sounds like that's an area she would focus on. Yeah, I think this definitely brings up um, the points I was making earlier about how important the confrontation clause uh, is going to be when uh, when we see the use of AI in uh, court contexts uh, in criminal prosecutions, because to the degree that somebody has altered the data. Uh, retroactively. Um, I'm not sure how that would affect, uh, you know, a, a tool that had a particular data set at point A, if you uh, alter it at point B and it had, you know, uh, detected or fingered somebody in between. But it goes to the importance of being able to uh, make witnesses available to question them about the data that goes into uh, a particular tool and how it works and to try and detect these kinds of potential um, 
malicious tampering, which is potent, potentially a, an option, not just in one particular case by case basis, but also as, as Aziz was talking about earlier, um, with regard to the disparate uh, impact and the need to show discriminatory intent for equal protection purposes. I think also it's going to be uh, important to continue to make vendors uh, and agencies that use these tools accountable. Um, and so that we're not only querying the data and the tool are also querying the humans who are involved in the tool to ensure that uh, this kind of miscarriage of justice does not happen. Thank you, Rihanna. Glenn, on the uh, FISA court question. Sure, uh, just very quickly, uh, most of your audience is familiar with it, but perhaps for some who aren't, uh, there is a, a special court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It sits in Washington, DC. It's a secret court. It's the only one in the United States that has all its proceedings conducted uh, in, under classified environment, um, consisting of judges appointed by the Chief Justice from around the United States to hear applications and matters arising under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act established in uh, 1978. Um, this court looks at very, very technical questions of collection of data uh, um, by the United States intelligence community, the FBI, the CIA, the, um, the National Security Agency, and evaluates them and decides whether in effect a search warrant is needed. They don't literally issue a search warrant, but something very comparable. Um, in order to do that, they really need to understand the technology and to assist them in understanding that technology. They have a panel of amicus, friends of the court, who are able to assist them in both the legal concepts as well as technically. They can, if needed, if need be, reach out to particular technological uh, experts for, for additional advice. I might add that uh, a companion uh, to that is the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, a government agency that, that uh, looks at the question of surveillance, particularly in the counterterrorism context. And it, uh, several years ago, appointed a chief technologist, an advisor who could just assist the board with some of these technical questions, because as been apparent for this past hour, um, we can't really have a full understanding of our privacy notions unless we understand exactly what the technical aspects uh, are and what, what is being searched and what's being surveyed. Um, so uh, uh, I think the court currently has adequate, ad adequate advisors in this regard, but can always use more, of course. Thank you so much, Glenn. Aziz, would you like to uh, speak to the regulate, regulatory agency's role, please? Yeah, I, I, I would just flag that circuit courts, which are the lower courts of appeal, have taken different views about Wayland. And you can, there are, there are subsequent Supreme Court cases such as NASA v. Nelson that are at least ambiguous on the question of informational privacy. So I, I you know, maybe I'm reading too much into the case law, but I, I am a little bit more optimistic um, on, on that uh, single point at least as the law stands. The, the idea of a regulatory agency with respect to AI tools was raised a number of years ago in a really terrific article by Andrew Tutt, uh, who argued that we should have uh, a, 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 the analog to the Food and Drug Administration for uh, algorithms. Um, to my mind, what would be, I, if it were p politically feasible to do something like that, and I should be clear that it's not, um, what I would think uh, warranted would be something that aggregates together existing technological expertise in the government, particularly that expertise that's driving innovation, and um, linking that um, expertise and innovation motor to the question of when and how should uh, AI tools be adopted, under what circumstances, domestically or internationally? Should there be certain tools that are simply off the table? Think here, for example, of the use of the genetic manipulation tool CRISPR with respect to human DNA, right? That, that is and should be off the table. Um, a, an agency that could do that probably would have within it uh, what, what is now DARPA, uh, which is a part of the uh, intelligence community, uh, and it would probably end up looking a little bit like either the CDC or uh, the NIT or NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Um, that's a great possibility, but I don't see it as a practical political reality anytime soon. That's perfect, Aziz. And on top of that, you answered the other question about what's off limits. So 
I would really much like to thank you again so much for a very rich conversation. I've taken plenty of notes. I was here to learn and I have, so thank you so much. And I hope it's the same for uh, attendees in the audience. Um, don't hesitate, please come back next week, next Friday. Uh, we're gonna have another session and I can't remember what it's about because I don't have my notes anymore, but wait, please come back. Um, yes, I think that's it. Have a wonderful rest of your day and weekend and uh, see you soon.